At, um, at previous IBD open days, we've had talks a lot about treatment. On the last occasion, you might remember, we talked about medical treatment and we had a surgeon, uh, uh, Sarah Duff, who was excellent on surgical treatment as well. So I wanted to think about a different topic. And uh, obviously, thinking about inflammatory bowel disease, naturally we talk in terms of UC and Crohn's disease. Um, but one of the commonest questions I get asked as a clinician uh, in patients suffering from these conditions when, when they're first diagnosed is, of course, the big question, why? Why on earth are all these people, 200,000 people in the UK, suffering from a disease? We're in the 20th century, for heaven's sake. Why can't we sort all this out? And instead of getting used to the topic of why, the older I get, the more I question the reasons and I almost have a, one single fantasy clinically and that's that uh, there will be a paper published in the Lancet one day, the cause of inflammatory bowel disease, J. Crampton et al. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, that probably is something of a fantasy, but I wanted to share with you some of the thoughts that uh, are currently developing about IBD management. Um, this is a perfectly healthy piece of bowel. This is a colon, a colonoscopy, and you can see that beautiful glistening lining of the bowel with the blood vessels easily seen uh, throughout and these horse trough folds of healthy muscle uh, driving uh, our guts along. And this, of course, is what it looks like in ulcerative colitis where the mucosa bleeds spontaneously. And you think, well, what makes that healthy bowel become like this with ulcerative colitis or, or even like this with Crohn's disease where you see uh, deep areas of ulceration and complete distortion of the normal architecture? What are the reasons behind this? What on earth is happening to people in whom these diseases develop? <coughs> And this complication here where the bowel has become so inflamed with Crohn's disease and the ulceration has become so deep that even fistulation has occurred. So other organs have been involved and drawn in by this, these awful conditions which people suffer from. So the cause of these is something that really is of extreme importance and urgency in terms of uh, research. I wanted to share with you today some of the thoughts that are going on in the research field about the etiology, the causation of inflammatory bowel disease. In order to have a credible hypothesis, you've obviously got to look at evidence, and some of the evidence that we need to look at is uh, what happens with inflammatory bowel disease, and we need to look at detective clues, if you like. We need to look at the geography of inflammatory bowel disease. We need to look at uh, the chronology, what's happened in time with inflammatory bowel disease. As Christian said, we need to look at family history issues, because these are obviously clues, and obviously another potential clue is the relationship between inflammatory bowel disease and smoking. So these are some of the clues which we have to think about if we're going to have a credible hypothesis of the causation of inflammatory bowel disease. The geography is important uh, and this little um, uh, map of the world, if you like, tells us a little bit about uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, predisposition. You can see from the map that uh, the red areas are where inflammatory bowel disease is most prevalent. So you'll see uh, the USA and Canada, um, Scandinavia and the UK have the highest incidence of inflammatory <coughs> bowel disease in the world. Uh, Southern Europe is it's slightly less common, but you can see great areas of blue uh, in the world, in Africa and Asia, where inflammatory bowel disease is relatively rare. Um, I had a, an Indian registrar recently who told me that he was quite surprised to see so much Crohn's disease in the UK because he saw more tuberculosis than Crohn's disease and they got quite excited in India if they saw somebody with Crohn's disease because it was a rare event. And so any hypothesis has to answer to us why it seems to be a condition of the Western world. It also seems to be uh, commoner in urban areas as opposed to rural areas and it appears to be commoner in higher social class as well than lower social class. So these sort of observations about the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease have to be taken into account when we consider any hypothesis of incidence. <coughs> 
The other peculiar thing is that Crone actually was this fella here, that is Dr. Crone. Dr. Crone was a gastroenterologist in the 1930s and he first described the condition of Crohn's disease in 1932. In other words, not millennia ago, this was a relatively new condition that was described just 80 years ago. Now this is obviously quite bizarre, so any hypothesis about the causation of Crohn's disease in particular has to take into consideration the fact that it, it appears to be a relatively new condition. You might say well, perhaps it wasn't recognised before but people have looked at medical literature and there does seem to be a definite new condition there because obviously medical records go back for hundreds of years in terms of descriptions of disease. So it's unusual and uh, worthy of thought that this condition was first described only, 18 years ago, uh, only 80 years ago and Crohn actually didn't want it to be called after himself, he wanted it to be called granulomatous terminal ileitis. <laughs> but I suppose, <laughs> I suppose given the choice of having GIT or GTI or Crohn's disease, I suppose Crohn's disease is going to stick for now. So relatively new condition and indeed not only that, in terms of the chronology as I was talking about earlier, uh, Crohn's disease seemed to increase in incidence over the latter half of the last century when it virtually tripled in incidence. In other words, we've got to explain any hypothesis why the condition seems to have become commoner. We believe it's more or less plateaued now, uh, but there was this very marked increase in incidence in Crohn's disease in the latter half of the last century. And interestingly, this was seen in all sorts of different uh, countries. Uh, you can see the increase in uh, uh, Wales was very similar to that in Derby, very similar to that in central Sweden and Denmark, and even <coughs> in westernised parts of Israel. And you can see in each of those countries there was a very marked increase in the incidence of Crohn's disease over the latter half of the last century. So that needs to be explained by any hypothesis as well. And then again we've got the family history. Many people with IBD have a family history of UC or Crohn's disease. Sometimes there'll be one member of the family has UC and another member of the family, perhaps a second degree relative, might have Crohn's disease. So it can affect different generations and both males and females. So that obviously seems to be telling us that there must be a genetic component to these conditions. So that's, I guess, clue number three. We've got smoking as well, which is quite interesting. It appears, good studies have demonstrated that ulcerative colitis is less common if you smoke. It's one of the conditions that if you smoke, you're less likely to get it. But conversely, of course, if you uh, do smoke, you're more likely to get Crohn's disease. So the risk of inflammatory bowel disease overall, in fact, pretty well cancels out. So there must be some factor in smoke uh, that uh, relatively protects from ulcerative colitis but makes it more likely for you to get Crohn's disease. So these are clues, if you like, as to <coughs> what might be the answer to inflammatory bowel disease, the causation. And these clues have got to be factored into our hypothesis. IBD obviously comprising those two conditions, they are very closely related, which is why we bracket them into IBD, but they are also quite different. Uh, clearly, ulcerative colitis only affects the colon, whereas Crohn's disease can affect anywhere in the large bowel. UC tends to be a continuous inflammation, like spreading from the rectum upwards, whereas Crohn's disease can be segmental, there can be little bits of your bowel inflamed as opposed to continuous disease. In ulcerative colitis, the inflammation is relatively confined to the surface of the mucosa, whereas of course in Crohn's disease, as I showed in that rather shocking photograph earlier on, the inflammation is very deep down and it can go into the outer layers of the bowel wall, which means that Crohn's disease often causes things like strictures and fistulae, whereas they're relatively rare events in ulcerative colitis. And furthermore, the pathology, when we look at it down the microscope, in ulcerative colitis, certain cells which are present in histopathological structures called granulomas are not present in ulcerative colitis, whereas they are in Crohn's disease. And so, whilst there are many similarities between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, there are also a lot of uh, differences. 
Having said that, other manifestations of UC and Crohn's disease, such as effects on, on joints, on mouth, uh, on eyes, uh, on skin, uh, are shared between <coughs> ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And that geographical <coughs> instance, which I showed you in the, the world map, is also shared by both UC and Crohn's disease, and also the family history. And aspects of treatment, of course, are also very similar between one or another. So just to remind you of the anatomy of the uh, gastrointestinal tract, obviously we've got the stomach here at the back uh, going down to the duodenum and here's the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine is called the jejunum and the second part is called the ileum. This is the terminal ileum which is frequently affected by Crohn's disease and this is the colon. And this is more or less how it is configured within our bodies. So I just show you that to remind you of the anatomy and of course with UC it tends to be continuous as I said uh, in many patients uh, it's confined to the rectum uh, which makes it sound mild but of course the proctitis as it's called can be quite severe and this is some, in some patients the inflammation affects the left hand side of the bowel in others the whole bowel is affected so the extent of ulcerative colitis can vary but what we get with Crohn's disease is different patterns. We can see in panel A, for instance, this person has um, uh, small intestinal inflammation, but in different segments. In other words, it's segmental, but it's confined to the small intestine. Panel B represents quite a common pattern of Crohn's disease where the ileum, the terminal ileum, and the ascending colon is affected. This is ileocecal Crohn's disease and is one of the commonest presentations. And panel C represents a patient with Crohn's colitis. They have inflammation in the large bowel, but it's caused by Crohn's disease because it's patchy in this particular individual. There's some rectal inflammation, then there's a normal bit of bowel, then there's some inflammation in the descending colon then there's some inflammation in the transverse colon so that's panel C would be Crohn's colitis and this patchiness also requires some explanation and understanding so when thinking about diseases we have to get our head around what does cause disease anyway and obviously there's lots of different mechanisms which I've itemized on this slide I don't need to go through them but clearly uh, one thinks about trauma one thinks about infection you think about neoplasm, which is like cancers, degenerative conditions, it, uh, autoimmune conditions is quite an important thing. Auto autoimmunity is this concept whereby somehow one's own immune system turns against your own body, so the, the, the part of the protective mechanism against infection turns against yourself. We've got metabolic conditions, we've got genetic conditions, and the question really is what mechanisms of disease may be at play in IBD? Gastroenterologists got a, a nasty shock in the 1990s because in 1983 a couple of Australian gastroenterologists discovered this bug called Helicobacter pylori. When I was um, Christian's age it was thought that duodenal and gastric ulcers were caused by stress and lifestyle and this is what we were taught and we accepted it without thought and the Australian gastroenterologist discovered this bug Helicobacter pylori and after a long period of research it was discovered that actually gastric and peptic ulcers were caused by this this bacterium in, in the stomach and it was very widespread and that all our hypotheses of, of causation of peptic ulcers were completely <coughs> swept aside and these two guys quite rightly got the um, Nobel Prize for Medicine in uh, I think it was about 2001 because they discovered that a disease was not thought to be due to infection was in fact due to infection and now we can cure duodenal and gastric ulcers completely with courses of antibiotics. So that's a lesson that sits in gastroenterologists' minds because obviously that makes us think, well, you know, could there be infections elsewhere that we don't really recognise? There's no suggestion, of course, that Helicobacter causes Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but I mention it as a cautionary tale about how easy it is to sit on our laurels and think we understand the condition, and then a revolution can occur that shows us that the condition is caused by something completely different. 
So, of course, the question arises, could infection be a cause of Crohn's or UC? And this has been subject to a huge amount of research and analysis, um, and a number of uh, different organisms have been hypothesised to be potential causes. Uh, perhaps one of the commonest is uh, this uh, mycobacteria, mycobacteria bacteria that are similar to the tuberculosis bacterium, which causes TB. And there are some similarities between some aspects of TB uh, and Crohn's disease in particular. So people have done research. There was a bit of a story in the 1990s about measles virus and a number of other different bacteria have been suggested as potential causes of inflammatory bowel disease, most of which have not been borne out by further research. This particular one, um, MAP, uh, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, uh, has had perhaps one of the largest uh, amounts of research spent on it because there was a chap called Herman Taylor in London who was convinced that this was the cause of Crohn's disease and provided some evidence that was initially supportive. Um, MAP also causes a similar sort of disease in cattle, which is called Jones disease, which makes the cattle absorb uh, their food poorly. And so there was quite a lot of publicity, especially in the 1990s, about MAP and Crohn's disease. Um, but in actual fact, um, measles virus has been largely um, rejected as well. Uh, in actual fact, most of the MAP work, although you'll still see it there on the internet uh, if you Google causes of Crohn's disease, most of that has now been largely discredited because of the fact that um, the results have been rather inconsistent and not replicated in other laboratories. And I suppose the clincher for me with MAP was that uh, trials have been done for, uh, to treat uh, patients with Crohn's and UC with antibiotics, uh, antibiotics which should be uh, effective against MAP and they don't make any difference. So I think the MAP story is probably, is probably uh, defunct at the moment. I think because of the Helicobacter story we've got to keep a bit of an open mind about infection but at the moment uh, we have to say that no infectious agent has withstood further scientific scrutiny because of this inconsistency of the results. Infections, however, can trigger IBD, uh, and we know that some, certainly patients who develop, uh, say, acute gastroenteritis, for instance, can have an increased incidence of IBD in subsequent uh, months, and that may be something to do with increase in intestinal permeability induced by the infection. Um, we also know that about 10% of people who have IBD already diagnosed uh, can have flare-ups uh, caused by infection. So about 10% of people admitted to hospital with worsening diarrhoea, for instance, related to their known UC or, or, or Crohn's, uh, will have picked up an infection that's triggered the disease. So we think triggers perhaps as a cause, but not the fundamental cause. Twin studies are crucial, really, to help identify the genetic component, and even before uh, detailed DNA analysis was available, there was quite a lot of work looking at uh, twin patients who suffered from IBD. As you'll be aware, I'm sure, that there are two sorts of twins. We've got identical twins, which I've pictured here as baby A and baby B. Identical twins, of course, are from a single egg that breaks into two after fertilization. So such babies are absolutely identical. Their DNA is completely the same as one another. They could have transplants between one another, for instance, without any rejection, because they are actually genetically absolutely identical. And they're called monozygotic twins. And then you've got non-identical twins. Uh, <laughs> and they're, of course, completely different, like Danny DeVito and the other fella. Um, <laughs> and they're called dizygotic twins. And if you look at dizygotic and, and monozygotic twins who have inflammatory bowel disease, it gives you a clue as to how much IBD might be due to the genes. This slide really is uh, quite a crucial one to take you through. It shows you that about 6% of people with UC and between 8 to 12% of patients with Crohn's disease have a first-degree relative. 
that's a lot higher than the background incidence and so that gives you a relative risk of developing um, uh, ulcerative colitis of 7 to 12 times over the background rate, a, a random rate if you like. And that rate is increased a little bit more in Crohn's disease, something like 15 to 35 times the background rate. But look at the twin studies, this is really interesting. So the monozygotic twins have a much higher incidence of Crohn's disease in the other twin or, or ulcerative colitis and this gives you a measure of how much would be a genetic factor so in other words the dizygotic twins are in the same family they're just as real they're, they're related like brother and sister but the monozygotic twins are genetically identical and their incidence of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is much higher and that tells you uh, that there must be a genetically inherited factor in the patients who have identical DNA. So the twin studies really were the clue that a genetic factor was present in both UC and Crohn's disease, although as you can see from the actual numbers it appears that that's more the case in Crohn's disease rather than UC. And when the Human Genome Project was undertaken in the 1990s and the human genome was sequenced in, I think it was 2002, wasn't it? Uh, something like that by Venter and his colleagues. We started to know more and more about genes and people started to do genetic studies of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And we now know that there's a number of inflammatory bowel disease genes. Uh, IBD1 was the first the, the name of the first gene which was isolated to be associated with inflammatory bowel disease it was on chromosome 16 it's associated with Crohn's but not UC and it enjoys the name uh, nod 2 which I won't which stands for nucleotide oleg oleg oligomodimerization or something of that kind which I never quite understood so we'll just call it nod for short um, but that interestingly people can then look at what the gene does and what NOD2 does is that it helps us identify substances on the walls of bacteria. So it helps identify bacteria present. So that's very interesting that something that helps identify bacteria being present should be associated with the condition. And there are various variants that are identified in Crohn's disease. And if you've got a couple of variants, it increases your risk of Crohn's disease by about 30-fold. And it's been calculated that about 23% of all Crohn's disease is attributable to variants in this gene. So this is a true an IBD gene and even more interesting it seems to be associated with different patterns of disease you'll remember I showed you those panels about how the disease can have different patterns in different people and the NOD2 gene uh, tends to coincide with early onset patients with ileal disease and people with stricturing disease. There are <coughs> other diseases that have, um, uh, other genes which have been associated as well and they seem to be related to uh, nearly all the sort of immune system and what happens to the immune system. IBD5 was the second one to uh, pitch up and IBD3 another. Again IBD5 seems to be associated with perianal disease so it looks as if your genetic background will determine what pattern of disease you get. And the research has gone on at such a pace it's really very difficult to keep up with it um, because there are now <coughs> around 160 genes that have been identified which are associated in different degrees not all as much as IBD1 but in different degrees have been associated with the development of IBD um, and the interesting thing is that most of these are shared between UC and Crohn's disease but some are unique to Crohn's and some are unique to uh, uh, you see. In other words, this might start to explain why Crohn's and disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are similar but not identical and probably the genetic uh, predisposition uh, gives us some clues as to why that might occur. So the actions of the genes associated with inflammatory bowel disease are related to immune pathways uh, which re recognize bacterial products, as I said, the NOD2 genes, but they're also um, pathways which allow removal of bacterial products, so-called autophagy, and also pathways which regulate immunity and pathways that regulate epithelial function. So that's what's going on in uh, inflammatory bowel disease and that's what the genes are telling us. And we've still got plenty of work to do about what all of these other 160 genes might be doing, but they seem to fall into those sort of four categories. And so this is getting us quite close to the sort of molecular 
pathways that might lead to the inflammation that causes Crohn's and UC. So this diagram sort of represents that really, that's the epithelium, these are the cells and the cells are recognizing bacteria, the cells are failing to respond to it so that the, uh, um, uh, the adaptive immunity is, is, is taking off and starting the whole inflammation and people are starting to understand some of these pathways and some of the molecules that actually trigger the inflammation in a very, very detailed way. Unfortunately, of course, as will be obvious to you from the twin studies, genetics can't be the whole answer. Even with Crohn's disease, with, mo with um, monozygotic twins, there was only a, about a 40% concordance rate. So even so, uh, twins don't all have to have Crohn's disease, so it can't be the whole answer. So twins are a long way short of 100% concordance, so there must be other factors. Furthermore, tw um, the genetics couldn't possibly explain the recent increase in incidence, which I intimated at the beginning, because of course there hasn't been very much change in the gene pool in the last 80 years, but there's been a huge change in inflammatory bowel disease. And we also know that second generation uh, immigrants, uh, particularly from the Asian subcontinent, start to acquire IBD at more or less the same rate as um, uh, native uh, uh, people living in the West. That also tells us that there must be an environmental factor. So there must be an environmental factor in addition to the genetics and the question really is what that is. We talked a little bit about smoking, we can talk a little bit about diet, obviously drugs, we talked a bit about geography, people have talked about stress in the Western world, Micro microbes, enteric flora, permeability perhaps, removal of the appendix which seems to exert an effect in in uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We think these environmental factors together with genes may influence the immune system and lead to inflammatory bowel disease. So that's the kind of model that people have. But what is the environmental factor? That's the big, big question. Sort of intuitively you think, well, it, it must be diet, mustn't it? It must be E numbers. It must be something that we're eating in the West that they don't eat in India and Africa and places where people are less well off. And somehow you must want it to be uh, diet because that seems logical. And yet studies haven't really been able to show consistent relationships between different types of diet leading up to the diagnosis. And people have looked at low carbs, high carbs, high fat, low fat. Um, processed food, unprocessed food. Lots and lots of work has been done, but it doesn't seem to have told us that diet is necessarily the reason for the development of IBD. Um, but of course, many people are helped by dietary advice once they've developed IBD. So that's a, I'm not saying diet isn't important, but I'm saying it, it doesn't look as if it's important in terms of the reason why people get it in the first place. So I don't believe there's any evidence that you get IBD by eating the wrong stuff. Uh, although diet obviously might help you once you already have that inflammation. There's something going on here about intestinal permeability. Somehow in IBD people are getting sensitized to bacteria that are present inside their gut and their immune system is detecting those bacteria and somehow overreacting to it. So it may be that there's something in uh, our lifestyle that is affecting the permeability of the gut. I've been quite interested personally and in whether or not detergents in our environment might have an influence here. Obviously detergents tend to dissolve fat and obviously fat is quite an important part of the barrier that we have in our guts and obviously consumption of detergents uh, has and use of detergents has increased very considerably over the latter half of the last century and one does wonder if that could have subtle effects on intestinal permeability in the human gut allowing the immune system which is perhaps genetically predisposed to see those bacteria and to then sensitize it by increasing the permeability and therefore developing IBD later in life. People speculated, this is, this is historic almost in a way, but people sort of say, well, what about sort of things that we do that people don't do in other parts of the world? We brush our teeth lots, don't we? And people have suggested that microparticles in toothpaste, for instance, I think this has been largely scotched, but I just mention it because I think when we're talking about etiology and causation of IBD, we've got to sort of think outside the box, haven't we? We've got to sort of think about anything that could be responsible. And people suggested that uh, microparticles might somehow sensitize or sit on bacterial 
products which then uh, added as a sort of adjuvant to make you overreact to these things. Worms. We always used to have worms, and we don't have worms now. You'll know there's a chap in America called Greg Weinstock who talks about worm therapy for Crohn's disease. And we tolerate worms when we've got them by modifying our immune system. And people have suggested that perhaps because we don't have worms anymore, well, we, we, we hope we don't anyway, <laughs> and, and if we do, we get rid of them pretty damn quick. Uh, and so people have suggested that perhaps, perhaps actually it was, it was somehow healthy for our guts to have worms because it allowed uh, tolerance to occur to bacteria that are normally present in the gut. Again, speculation really about the immune system <coughs> rather than a real theory. I guess the most popular thought really is that there may be some sort of subtle alteration in the gut microflora and people have used the term dysbiosis for this. Um, the um, idea of this is that uh, we all have masses and masses and masses of bacteria in our gut. You'll remember this uh, little diagram of the uh, gastrointestinal tract and on the right hand side this tells us how many bacteria that you tend to have in that part of the gastrointestinal tract and when you come down to the small intestine there's not quite so many but there's between a thousand and a million per mil per milliliter so in other words uh, you know that's five mils in a teaspoon for instance of of content but in the colon there's vast numbers there's up to a trillion bacteria per gram of stool in the colon so vast numbers and also lots and lots and lots of different species so we've got billions upon billions upon billions of bacteria of different species in our guts and the question is whether or not this might be disrupted in people who suffer from inflammatory bowel disease in some subtle way so that their immune system then reacts to this and uh, there's huge variability between people uh, these, oh, I won't go through these wonderful names, but these are lots of different types of bacteria and how in different individuals the balance is completely different. And there's a lot of research now going on into um, fecography, if you like. In other words, looking at the bacteria that are present in each and every one of our guts and how it can be different from person to person. And perhaps the person who suffers from IBD has some dysbiosis in their colon, some variability of balance uh, which uh, in, in allows their immune system to become sensitized to it. And obviously this could, for instance, relate to antibiotic usage, not necessarily in ourselves, although that might be possible, but also <coughs> antibiotic usage perhaps in animals, for instance, uh, which comes through into the human food chain. One hypothesis suggested what's called the cold chain hypothesis, which suggested that certain bacteria that are immune to cold would be selected out because we've used a lot more refrigeration uh, in recent years. So food is refrigerated, but some bacteria continue to proliferate in cold. Uh, they're not usually pathogenic, but perhaps that might be responsible for a degree of dysbiosis in the human gut and therefore predisposed to um, <coughs> inflammatory bowel disease in that way. The hygiene hypothesis that um, uh, Sin um, you alluded to, uh, Christian, is also one that uh, interests a lot of people. The idea being that we sort of we, we bring up our children in a little bubble, you know, being very protected. The babies are very hygienic and looked after. So the idea being that perhaps they're not exposed to bacteria, parasites, toxins, viruses as much as they should be, so that when they get older, they develop problems with their immune system because they haven't been exposed at an early enough age. This is a common hypothesis for the explanation for the development of allergies and so on. And of course, it could have a bearing on inflammatory bowel disease. <laughs> the idea is that <laughs> so bring them up mucky. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think we can regard this as proven. But you know, it has to be factored in because of those uh, because of those observations I made earlier on about about chronology, about the increased incidence. So any hypothesis has got to help us try and explain that. Um, so. In summary, really, what I'm saying is we say we don't know the cause of inflammatory bowel disease, but we do know a heck of a lot about it, and we are getting closer and closer and closer to the answers. We know that it is related to intestinal bacteria. We know that it's related to the immune response to intestinal bacteria. We know that it's related to bacteria being able to be seen by antigen-presenting cells, which then starts off the inflammatory process. And the, the knowledge that we gain from understanding about the genes 
means understanding about the bacteria and the dysbiosis means that we may well be able to develop new treatments. This slide is very busy and I don't intend really to take you through it, but what it, it was published in a recent paper about each causation of inflammatory bowel disease and what each of these little boxes represents is a potential treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. So the point about all that I'm saying really is that it's not just interesting theoretically but if we actually understand what's going on uh, in the mucosa of people who suffer from inflammatory <coughs> bowel disease on a molecular level we can of course develop new treatments. In other words, if we can understand it, we can, if we can understand pathways, we can block them and we can get people better. And obviously the bottom line really <coughs> is allowing us to develop a better understanding of IBD so we can develop better treatments. And this is what this slide is demonstrating. There's various different places where we can block or facilitate uh, treatments. So that hopefully, you know, one day we might mm. be able to get the causation of inflammatory bowel disease and maybe people with a happy tummy and maybe even one day possibly even a cure. Thank you very much.